integration, pretty much anything to do with economics and globalization, Dr. Mube is an expert on. So we're very, very, very privileged to have them. So let's have a great big effort. John, John and you to do Professor Mube. Um, so I'm, um, as um, Dr. Mueller um, mentioned, I'm a professor in uh, economics at Sonoma State, and I more or less embody globalization myself. So I grew up in France. I came um, uh, as a student. I met my husband, who's Chinese. So now we live in an international family. Um, so I'm basically. Uh, one example of what globalization is, which is um, you get that interdependence across countries through different means, flow of goods and services, trade, that's usually the thing you're going to think about first, but it also comes in the form of flows of labor, like me, immigration, immigration, flows of, of capital goods, so it's when you have a U.S. company building uh, an assembly plant in Mexico, for example, um, but it also comes in the form of an increasing role of international organizations like the International Monetary Fund, the UN, the World Trade Organization in uh, constraining uh, domestic policies. Because if you want to be able to trade, we need to set up rules, right? And some of those rules are set by the WTO. And as a result, if US president said, oh, I'm going to raise tariff on um, Mexican imports by 20%, he cannot actually do that currently, given the, the World Trade Organization rules. Um, and also come, and that's something I'm not going to uh, touch too much uh, to, uh, today, in the form of increasing cultural homogeneity. So when I go to Paris, I can still get my favorite latte in the Starbucks. Um, uh, the you know, if I were to go to a French university, they would still be wearing the same type of uh, jeans you wear. Um, uh, you find McDonald's everywhere. Um, so that's another aspect of globalization that uh, won't be covered too much today. So I'm going to mostly focus on uh, the first two, so the uh, interdependence. And what I'm trying to do today is um, first, uh, and that's something I'm, uh, I'm covering more and more in my class, is to try to um, explain the increased discontent that we have observed uh, regarding globalization in the United States, but it's, you know, it's true in many European countries. And um, that discontent has basically grown with the last recession we've had in the US, 2008-2009, uh, was basically the most severe economic downturn we've experienced since the Great Depression. Um, and it was further eroded, I felt, uh, last year during the uh, U.S. election campaign, uh, because on both sides of the political spectrum, we've had anti-trade rhetorics. Um, and so I found that interesting graph uh, from the Wall Street Journal uh, that's uh, shown that basically uh, over the last two years, uh, the decrease in support for global trade was even more uh, <coughs> substantial among Republicans than uh, among Democrats. Um, and so when you survey people a bit further and you ask them, okay, what's, you know, what are the different aspects of globalization um, that we could consider and how do you feel about them? Um, usually, they, they're, the main concern that people have about um, how global trade might affect their economy has to do with um, the effect that this might have on economic growth. So more people, um, are, most people are concerned that uh, more trade with other countries triggers slower growth in your uh, domestic economy, and I'll show you that that's usually not true. Um, concern about wages, uh, the fact that uh, a lot of people see uh, deeper interaction with other countries as leading to a race to the bottom in terms of labor standard. So if we trade with Mexico or China, and, you know, uh, and those countries are, you know, on average have lower um, income um, and wage level. Uh, the only way we're going to survive if, if you know, we compete on the cost and we're, the only way we can bring down the cost of production would be by lowering our labor standard. That's usually the argument that's put forward and that's why a lot of people have the belief that um, if we trade more, uh, it will push our wages lower. And I'll show you that that's not necessarily the case on average. Um, and related to this, uh, the concern that um, 
uh, we're going to have uh, more job loss related to trade than job creation. And again, that's not necessarily true either. So a lot of, you know, if you survey the general population, a lot of concern about the effect that the globalization will have on them, on their economy. But if you survey people who are, you know, in academia or people who are scholars of international relations or international, um, uh, international economics, you don't get the same perspective. Most scholars, like myself, still believe that the U.S. is better off as part of that global economy. And that shutting ourselves from this type of deeper economic in, uh, interaction would actually be, um, uh, uh, will make us worse off. So I, my, you know, the, the, the thing I, I feel like we need to address is where is that gap come from? Is it um, the fact that we don't provide the general public with um, the right set of information? Or is it because we've done a poor job at explaining how um, the, global, um, uh, the glo global trade or globalization affects our economy. So my goal in uh, today's presentation is to basically show you different aspects of um, how the globalization affects us and try to explain where that gap might be coming from. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, I'm happy to answer them as they come along or you can come and ask me after class, after lecture, or tonight uh, at the round table. Or email me um, later on if, uh, you, you know, if it takes a while to process information. So my view is that so far we've had a hard time selling politically globalization because um, in economics, you know, when we study how people make choices, we, uh, you know, uh, we, we believe that Choices should be made on, uh, based on the cost-benefit analysis. You do something only if the costs are lower than the benefit, right? And so if you want to explain, for example, why it, you know, the U.S. should be uh, participating in that global economy, you have to convey the idea that the benefit for us as a, as a society, as a country, outweigh the cost. And the reason why it's hard to, um, to get the message out is because even though the benefits are substantial, and I'll, I'll show you that in a second, they tend to be very diffuse in the economy or even diffuse in how we benefit, you know, how we, uh, we get them as individuals. But the, the costs tend to be pretty concentrated. There will be losers in the economy, in the U.S. economy from trade. And it's easier to identify those losers, those, those group of individuals that suffer, from globalization than it is to really make people aware of how we all benefit from it. So let me give you examples of uh, this, the benefits we get from trade for the U.S. and other countries. So the first, that's usually if you take uh, international econ class, the first thing you'll, you'll learn about trade theory is that the reason why we benefit from this type of interaction is when you don't have to be self-sufficient and produce everything you need uh, to consume then you'll tend to specialize in some productions and you'll tend to specialize in the production of stuff that you are relatively better than other countries at making. And by specializing in producing only a few things, right, that are usually the, um, the one where you have a, a lower disadvantage, that's what we call the comparative advantage, you end up using uh, in a more efficient way your time, all your res resources, your labor. And at the end of the day, what that does is we end up with a larger production uh, inside an economy and worldwide. So think about, you know, even within a country or even a town, what would happen if you had to be self-sufficient? You had to make your own clothes, grow your own food, educate yourself, right? Do all those things in 24 hours. You could clearly not get the same quality education, the same quality clothes. You wouldn't be able to grow um, the same variety of goods to, uh, um, to buy and to eat. So if we agree that we are going to rely on this type of exchanges so you don't have to be self-sufficient, you get access to a lot more stuff, right? So it's true within a town, within a country, but it's also true at, uh, at, the, at the world level. Another benefit I see from, uh, from globalization is that as our economies become interdependent, um, you have less incentive to hurt other countries, right? If 
I know that a lot of, of my firms depend on exports they sell to your country. I don't want your, ec your economy to suffer because then it's going to hurt me as well. And the European Union is a clear example of that. Right? So uh, after 45, right, the world was tired of having Germany and France being basically at the center of two ma ma you know, uh, major uh, global wars, World War II and World War I. And so the, one of the key motivations behind the construction of that um, uh, uh, trade agreement was to say, well, if we tie the French and the German economy so that they become interdependent, they're very less likely to start a war with one another because if you know, um, they damage the other economy, it's going to hurt them uh, themselves automatically. And it's true now if you think about, for example, the relationship between the US and China. Right? China is the first uh, country we import from. It's the, th the third country we export to. Um, whether you know, it will be in the US interest to go to war with China, I really doubt it right now. Um, if I look at what globalization has done to other countries, it has lifted a lot of people out of poverty. So if I take again the case of China, um, I gave you some statistics about uh, the change in income in China. So China started to really open up to global trade um, at the end of the 1980s, early 90s. At the time, your average person in China earned less than 300 bucks a year. By the time um, we, you know, they moved, and, and so I give you uh, here, uh, you know, a different level of income, but you see that, you know, within basically 20 years, uh, their income was multiplied by uh, almost uh, 10, uh, 10, and right now their income level is around um, $6,500. Uh, just as a benchmark in the US, our average uh, per capita income is above $50,000. But so that meant that basically for, uh, for the Chinese uh, uh, population, income has grown roughly at a 10% rate a year. And that's hard to really you know, um, visualize what that means, but using a simple mathematical rule, that basically means that your income level doubles every seven years. So every seven years, you are receiving uh, twice as much income as you did seven years ago. In the US, it almost takes a generation for our income to double, right? So things are changing very fast, and for the Chinese economy, it's, you know, it's been very positive. So as a result, uh, for the Chinese economy, all as a result of that fast growth, which was uh, significantly um, um, uh, promoted by uh, their integration in the global economy, we've lifted 600 million people out of poverty. So for a country like China, integration in that global economy uh, has been clearly beneficial. But there's also a lot of benefits for our economy, right? It's not trade, and that's the mistake that a lot of people make, it's not a zero-sum game. So it's not because the Chinese have gained a lot from their integration to the global economy that we are automatically losers. So here are some examples of how our economy benefits from that uh, um, participation in uh, the global economy. <laughs> it's new markets for our US firms, right? Um, if I take the uh, aircraft industry right now, if Boeing had to rely on uh, the U.S. airline markets, they wouldn't be selling many, uh, many, uh, many air airplanes. They sell uh, much more planes now to the emerging market where the middle class is growing and more people want to travel. Right? Um, and the benefit from having exporting firms is that those firms tend on average to pay higher wages, 15% higher than the national average. Okay, um, something that uh, usually you hear when uh, we talk about the U.S. trade, you hear that we run a trade deficit, which means we tend to uh, import more value than we export. That's true for goods like cars, T-shirts, computers, but it's not true for services. In the service industry, legal services, accounting services, financial services, we actually run a surplus. We're the largest exporter of services. And if you think about the U.S. economy, where the vast majority of our production comes in the service industry, mo most of you will end up working in the service industry once you get a job. Um, uh, we actually have a leading position. Um, some economists have tried to estimate uh, what was the benefit at the household level from our participation in global trade. 
and they've estimated that um, for the, the entire US economy, um, the, uh, we have basically enjoyed almost a 10% increase in national income as a result of all the things that came with our participation in the world uh, economy, which boils down to roughly $10,000 a year per US household. Okay? Um, another thing that comes with uh, trade is, again, the fact that we specialize right, in uh, the production of uh, things we're relatively better at making is that we're able to get cheaper stuff from overseas. Tonight, when you go home right, and you uh, put on your PJs, look at all the labels of the, the clothes you wear today. Most of the stuff you wear, most of the shoes you wear today, they're all made overseas. 86% of the, of the shoes you wear in the US, what you buy in the US, are made overseas. Okay? And um, as a result, uh, for example, the clothes we buy now um, cost as much as they did in 1986. How about education cost? Are you paying today the same price that people paid 30 years ago? No, right? Sadly, enough for you guys, right? Uh, furnishing the house is actually cheaper now than it was 35 years ago. Okay, so why is that a good thing? The fact that you don't you don't have to spend so much on closing today. How does that help you? How does that help your bottom line? So the fact that now, if you buy you know, a pair of sneakers, you can get a nice pair for like 60 bucks instead of having to pay maybe 200 bucks. What does that do? How does that help you out? Yeah, and what can you do with that extra money? But you buy other stuff, right? If you don't have to spend 200 bucks on a pair of shoes, well then either you can pay more than one pair per year, right? Or you can, you know, uh, you'll have more, uh, more income available to go see a movie or uh, do other things uh, uh, with that, the, the same amount of income. Um, so excluding food and energies, um, uh, price of goods have fallen. So, Energy, like uh, you know, oil, it fluctuates a lot with the oil market, so those are a little bit harder to, um, uh, to predict. The other thing that trade does is we can get stuff that we would not be able to enjoy if um, we were just uh, relying on domestic production. Um, if you want to eat a mango or a banana today, is that US produced? If you want to have a, uh, you know, drink a cup of tea, is that made in the US? If you want to uh, drink a, a cup of coffee, where is that coffee bean mostly coming from? Latin America, right? If we had to rely on Hawaiian coffee, your cup of coffee would, you know, would cost a lot more than just uh, you know, a dollar. So more trade also means that we have more, more choice in terms of what we can buy. Right? If you had to just rely on domestic products for, you know, like, let's say, produce, you would be eating potatoes, po uh, carrots, cabbage, leeks. Forget about greens, you know, like green beans, grapes, all those other. Uh, so we have clearly, uh, the grocery store, you clearly benefit from uh, globalization. All right, so that's one benefit. Now, the reason why you don't necessarily think about that unless you're an international economist is because I suppose every time you buy something, you don't necessarily check where it was made, right? And um, the other uh, issue is that the benefits tend to be diffuse. So I just mentioned that on average, right, a household gets um, a boost in their income about around $10,000 uh, $10, a year from uh, trade. But when you get your paycheck, you don't have a line that says 10% of that wage came from our involvement in trade. You don't, you don't necessarily see it, right? Uh, you don't necessarily have a, a good a sense that right now the shoes you buy are cheaper than what they could have uh, cost if they had been made uh, domestically. Uh, you don't necessarily think about, oh gee, what would happen if I had to only buy the, uh, vegetables made uh, in the US and we're in the middle of winter? because that's not something that uh, you'll, tend to, uh, you'll, you'll tend to think about. Um, the other thing that we uh, don't necessarily think about, about uh, you know, as a benefit from trade, usually one thing that people think is, well, if we get okay, shoes from China, I'm sure we could get better quality shoes if it was made in the US. We get crappy stuff coming from China. And that's not necessarily true. 
competition, the fact that our domestic firms now are facing more competition means that if they want you to buy their stuff, they have to deliver quality. They have to give you an incentive, right, to buy their product as opposed to their competitors. So here is an example of what competition from the Japanese made cars has done to the US car quality. One thing you, uh, the car industry does to measure the quality of their product is to look at how many defects exist per car. So back in uh, 1980, when we started to really have a massive inflow of Japanese car as a result of the oil shock that uh, increased significantly the price of gas, uh, US buyers said, gee, we need to find more fuel efficient cars. Right? So that's why they started to look into the Japanese car uh, 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 company. So in 1980, on average, if you look at 10 cars made in the US, there was on average around 110 defects per 100 cars. So you had at least on average more than one defect per car. The Japanese uh, cars produced at the time had almost a third of that amount of defaults. And look what happened to the quality of the cars made in the US after that. And guess what that was? You know, what really triggered the car makers to get their thing together and finally provide the US consumers with something that was of better quality? Because now they knew that there was a substitute, right? Uh, US uh, buyers were not dumb, and if they could see a better made cars made from Japan for the same price, they will go for the Japanese made uh, cars because we're rational. You know, for the same price, you'll get the better product. So that's one thing that also comes from um, globalization, that push for providing better stuff to our consumers. Otherwise, you lose markets. But again, the problem is most of the time, you don't really, you don't really see, right? The, the, the car makers are not going to say, you have now all those different new options on your car, or you're less likely to have mechanical problems uh, with your car because uh, the Japanese make better cars than we do. Right? They're not going to advertise their new product this way. So it's hard for the consumers to really integrate in their, uh, uh, in their thoughts the benefits from trade. Okay? So the benefits are there. They're hard to visualize or to really experience for people. But we can see the cost a lot more uh, clearly. And usually the main ways we're going to visualize the cost of, uh, of globalization would be in the form of drought loss. Okay, so I'm not, and that's something that I, I want to make sure you understand. As an economist, we always look at the, the two sides of the story, the cost and the benefits. So there are clearly costs uh, um, associated with uh, our interaction with other countries because clearly if we start specializing in some goods, we're not going to produce all the other stuff, right, that we now import. So some jobs will be lost. And that's roughly to the amount of um, a quarter million a year. Okay? Most people do find a job afterwards, but we do have some that stay unemployed for an extended period of time. And usually that's the type of job that you're going to hear about in the news. Right? So an example I found recently in the Wall Street Journal was about um, the furnishing industry. And um, historically, North Carolina had several counties that were specializing in the production of sofas and wood furniture. Now, most of the a big chunk of the furniture we buy is made in China. So clearly, when those uh, furnishing companies have closed in those counties in uh, North Carolina, there was clearly pockets of poverty and unemployment. It was hard for some of those people to find jobs in other industries. So it's easy to write an article about how trade has negatively affected those communities. Right? Um, and also, uh, what uh, could also happen with, with uh, uh, with trade is that, as we uh, told you earlier, you're going to have people who work in the export sector, think about, for example, um, you know, uh, the high-tech industry, that tend to enjoy higher wages than the average wage. And on the other hand, you're going to have people who lose their job as a result of um, our uh, increased uh, uh, imports. So as a result, trade could participate in the growth in income inequality, even though uh, income inequality in the U.S. started much before um, uh, gl uh, global trade really uh, took off in the 1990s. Now, the thing I want to now emphasize is the fact that if we do lose jobs as a result of trade, trade is not the main culprit. So, <coughs> 
In the US, especially, uh, so the, the usually the emphasis is going to be put on manufacturing jobs because for people who have low skill level, they tend to pay high, relatively higher wages than the uh, service industry. But if you look at manuf the manufacturing sectors, most of the jobs we've lost in that industry were the result of automation and better technology. So some people who have lost their job um, in, uh, in the Rust Belt in the US, they haven't lost necessarily their job to a Chinese or Mexican worker, they've lost their job to a robot, okay? So there was a, uh, a study done uh, by some, um, uh, uh, some researchers at the Ball State University and they found that out of the 5.6 million jobs we've lost in manufacturing between 2000 and 2010, 85% of those jobs were lost to automation. So the fact that we use uh, more robots in the production process. And trade really accounts only for 15% of those jobs lost. Okay? So we've been able to produce a lot more manufacturing goods, right? Compared, uh, starting in uh, 1990, so we have more than doubled our production, employing fewer people because we, uh, we use more machinery. Well, we use more capital stock, better technology, so we can produce more output with less input. But again, that's something that usually is not, you know, uh, if you think about last year, uh, trade was mostly seen as the main ex explanation behind the job loss in, um, in some of those uh, uh, pivot uh, states uh, for the election. So uh, to understand why, I think the current view about what we should do about trade uh, is not appropriated. I want to emphasize the difference between the globalization we live in now and the globalization that uh, started um, after World War II. So until the 1990s, the, you know, uh, that's what I call the old globalization. And if you think about the flow of goods and services, uh, what happened is you had actual finished goods crossing the border. So think about the car industry I, um, I alluded to earlier. You had a Japanese car that was made in Japan, put on a boat, shipped over the Pacific, and then uh, entering the US market, ready to be driven away by uh, the final buyers. For this type of globalization, then it was a real competition between domestic production and foreign production, right? US made cars against Japanese made cars. Uh, and as a result, you did have at the time that an entire uh, US industry could be, um, could be uh, threatened by a foreign competitors. But now, the new globalization we currently live in is very different as a result of the information and communication technology revolution, the ICT revolution. So the you know, increase in uh, uh, the use of computers, uh, decrease in the cost of communication. Um, and the reason why it had had an impact on the type of, uh, of trade and the flows of goods and services that we uh, experience now is because it led to what we call in economic, uh, economics a global supply chain. So if you think about how cars are made now, right, if you think about the uh, US brand, Ford, where is the car design? Where is the new design or most of the engineering done? In which country or which state is that coming from? I heard it. It's from the US. And now, so the design, right, some of the uh, um, critical components, electri electronic components might come from, from the US. Uh, you might have heard, we, as a result of some of the recalls, where are the airbags maybe coming from? Uh, or I think it was a Japanese company, so the airbags might come from, uh, from, uh, from Japan. And where are the, now after uh, the implementation of the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, where is that car likely to be assembled? In? It's in America as a continent, but not in the United States, in? That's a big thing Trump was really pushing. Mexico. Mexico, thank you. So that's what we mean, a global supply chain. You have basically a good that's basically uh, assembled in one country, but parts are gonna come from different places. Another example of this would be your favorite electronic devices. 
aka your phone, smartphone, or your tablet. So technically, when you look at trace statistics, your iPhones are imports from China. Right? Your iPad comes from China. Your tablet comes from China. But uh, so I was looking at some statistics. So a typical basic iPad Air costs roughly, or if I'm not talking about the pro one, 400 bucks. Right? Uh, the Japanese, the, there's a, in China, right? We have a Taiwanese company that assembled the iPad uh, uh, China before it's shipped into the US. They basically, that assembly component that China provides, it's only, uh, it's the roughly 2% of the value of the iPad. Because it's really just a simple task we ask unskilled labor to do. So why do we end up spending 400 bucks on an iPad? So there's the brand and, I mean, those are pretty cool devices, right? So why do we agree to pay so much for a device? Where is that value coming from? It's clearly not the assembly done in China. Where is the value coming from? Design. From where? Design. From the design. And where is that design uh, made? Right? A few, uh, few hundred, miles from, uh, hundred miles from here, right? Silicon Valley. So, and there's clearly the marketing, but that's, again, it's an Apple team. So most of the value of your iPad, it's not coming from China, it's coming from the United States. It's the engineering. Same thing if you think about your Nike shoes, right? You have nice uh, basketball or running shoes. They cost ab above 100 bucks, right? They're made in China. Is it really the sewing part of the, of the shoe that costs that much? So why do you, are you willing to pay so much for a pair of shoes? I, am, I'm, I buy expensive shoes too, so I, you're not guilty. I have expensive running shoes. So why are we, what makes the running shoe so, so expensive? It's not the plastic or the, you know, the materials it's made from, right? It's, so, but the reputation, so if you're a runner, what are you looking for? Like shoes that, right, best for running because you have a shock absorption, you know, um, they're gonna really have a, they're gonna be um, stable, you're not gonna twist your ankle. Uh, so if you're Ni Nike, where is the headquarter? Do you guys know anyone from Oregon? Nike's headquarter is, uh, is around Portland, right, Portland. So most of the design of the shoe, right, is gonna be done in the US. And the reason why you're willing to pay 100 bucks for that pair of Nike shoe or another running shoes, it's not for the materials, it's for the design and uh, the comfort they provide. So that value is mostly coming from, from the US. Okay, so it's more fragmented. So we're not offshoring all that production. We tend to offshore only the very simple task, the, the assembly, the sewing, right? The, sew, the, the sewing part of, uh, of, uh, of the shoe. So the type of job we've offshore, so when you offshore, a, a job meaning you have a job that basically leaves the country. We're not offshoring the mirror image of the job that used to be in the US, right? If you think about, again, the, uh, the, uh, the car industry, the job that have been created in Mexico, they were mostly assembly jobs. Not the type, uh, the typical job that a US worker would have had in a US factory. So saying that I'm gonna close the, you know, the factory in Mexico uh, uh, and then the job will come back in the US is basically sending dust in people's eyes because it's not the way it's gonna happen. Now what we've done is we've taken a job that used to be held by a US worker and we've divided between two uh, two people and thing, one robot and one uh, foreign worker. And unless you can merge the robot and the worker back into one person, it's not gonna come back the way it used to be. So if you, um, so if you think about then that supply chain and you say, okay, I'm gonna put a tariff on those cars that come back from Mexico. Are you only hurting the, the Mexican assembly plant? Who could get hurt too if we, uh, we prevent part of the production process to be done in Mexico? So US, right, companies, right? If you're in engineering working for Ford and Ford has a tough time making uh, 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 its production as efficient and they produce fewer cars, they might have to lay off engineers in, uh, in Michigan, right? Um, so, the, the, what I want you to get out of this is that 
if you raise trade barriers, the way, so the way people have approached protectionism is basically using a tool that was maybe adapted for the old globalization and try to apply it for a new globalization, but it's not gonna work. So using this type of old uh, commercial policy of I'm gonna raise a you know, tariff, is basically a tax you impose on foreign goods. So I'm gonna impose a tariff on cars coming from Mexico. The best an analogy I can come from, it's as if you build a wall not between the U Mexico and the US, you're building a wall inside a US factory because you prevent one stage of the production to be, uh, to be completed. So you hurt not just the Mexican workers, you're gonna prevent Mex some US workers to do their job as well. Okay? All right, so again, the bottom line of this is that <coughs> with our new globalization, the old technique of raising trade protection by using tariffs is not gonna, it's not gonna bring back those jobs that we've lost. And again, most of those jobs were lost to robots, not to uh, mix, uh, foreign workers. Any question on that? Okay. And then I wanted to give you some numbers so that you understand that protectionism, so it's when you prevent free trade, is not usually the answer if your goal as a government is to create jobs. So here are some uh, statistics about uh, what happens when you protect some domestic uh, industries. So for the sake of our discussion, let's focus on the last few rows that focus on uh, the US economy. So uh, we're looking at protection that's uh, uh, provided to uh, the agricultural sector, the clothing industry, and the textile industry. Do you guys understand why if I raise a tariff, so I put an extra tax on a t-shirt you can buy from uh, Indonesia or um, uh, from Vietnam, why does that hurt the consumers? Which is basically what that number is, those are millions. Yes. Exactly, that means you're, uh, the price tag you're gonna pay for, um, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna go up, right? So it's gonna hurt your bottom line in terms of your budget. So usually the argument that uh, policymakers put forward is to say we're gonna save jobs, right? Then let's just do a back of the envelope calculation. That's the cost to, to the consumers, right? So in the clothing industry, we're talking about uh, 21 uh, uh, billion dollars. Those are the jobs that are saved. So if I divide up equally the total cost to the consumers by the number of jobs we saved, basically this is how much we spend per job we save. So in cl the clothing industry, uh, it's a little bit more than, it's almost $140,000 a year per job saved. Now do you know how, what the, uh, I, I gave you that statistics a few minutes ago, what's the per average per capita income in the US right now? It was 50. Does that make any sense to you? So if I really wanted to help those guys, what would be a most cost efficient way of making sure that people who lose their job as a result of trade still get a way to su support their family? What would be cheaper? You just write them a blank check, right? It's easier if I say, okay, you want to make the same earnings as someone who uh, currently has a job. If I write you a $50,000 check, it costs less to us as a society as uh, than if we were to use um, uh, commercial policy as uh, a way of saving jobs. Uh, more recently, so an example I found was, um, I think it was in 2009, the Obama administration imposed a, uh, a, um, a, um, a tariff on Chinese tires, because we have a lot of competition for that. And roughly the estimate I found that was done by the uh, Peterson Institute for Economics um, found that basically for the few jobs that we saved, uh, we spend as a society uh, uh, around uh, $900,000. Because now you had basically um, a clear big cost for consumers. But my favorite example how commercial policy is the wrong way of saving jobs is to use the our sugar industry. Okay, uh, do you know what this is? Do you recognize that jar? Nutella, so I'm coming from Europe, so I don't eat peanut butter, I'm still a Nutella person. Anyone eats Nutella? Okay, so tonight, when you go home, check the tag on the label on, your, on the jar. 
And you'll see that, so last time I checked, uh, it was made in Canada. Why, why Canada? Well, that's because um, even though it's sold as a hazelnut chocolate uh, spread, a big ingredient of that spread is sugar. And as a result of uh, our sugar policy in the US, which basically limit significantly the, the, uh, the quantity of chocolate, of uh, sugar we import from uh, other countries. Uh, and then uh, not only we limit the quantity we can import from other countries, but we also put a tariff on the, 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 the sugar that comes in. And uh, we also have like a allotment system that limits how, how much sugar each state in the US can produce. So as a result of that very complicated policy, uh, the blue line represents, so you know sugar can come from two sources, beets and sugar cane. cane. So for uh, the sugar that comes from beets, like the one produced in state like California, that's the average price we pay in the US, and that's the average world price. So we pay on average uh, 29 cents per pound, while uh, the world average is half that. So in the US, anything you buy that has sugar, it, you know, the cost of the sugar is twice what it would be if we were to just import sugar uh, freely from other countries. So what does that mean, right? Well, that means that every time you eat a chocolate bar, you eat cereals, because the cost of producing those sh sugary things, ha you know, has gone up, you're gonna pay a higher price. Okay, so we're trying to save jobs in the sugar production industry, but as a result, right, we're gonna lose jobs in all the sectors that use sugar, right, like the, the candy industry. So for every job you save in the production of sugar, you lose three in the confectionery industry. So that's something that, again, people don't necessarily think about, is if I put a, a, a restriction on steel, for example, in the US, coming from other countries, I'm going to hurt all the other industries in the US that use steel. Yes, please. Um, is that issue like confectionery? Uh, so confectionery, uh, so the sugar, no, it's just uh, ma made from uh, beets or uh, sugar cane. But, um, the, obviously, in the confectionery industry, where they make candies, they do use corn syrup too. Yeah. Um, okay, and as a result, again, uh, it's not necessarily labeled on every chocolate bars you eat, but check, you know, next time you have some chocolate where it's made, and the changes that some of it will be actually coming from uh, over uh, over the U.S. Another thing that could happen too is the that. Well, if countries are prevented from selling their goods to our country, they're not going to just sit there and say, that was not nice, right? They're going to retaliate. You poke me in the eye, I'll poke you back. So you're trying to save a few uh, sugar from the U.S., and you're going to hurt other industries. So Brazil, for example, who's a big uh, producer of, sh of sugar cane, they decided to slash uh, a higher uh, uh, protection to prevent a, uh, importing U.S. grain. So that basically hurts the Midwest uh, agriculture. All right, so the bottom line is that if you're, trying, you're concerned about the job loss that comes with trade, raising tariffs is not the way, or raising protection um, is not the way to do it because it's not transparent. Sometimes you're gonna hurt other industries down the road. And again, if, you're tr you know, if you want to really help those people find new jobs, you know, an option would be um, you help them retrain, right? Or uh, you have s uh, more sound microeconomic policies, so you give, you know, tax rebate to some uh, companies who could create more jobs. But messing up with free trade is usually not the most efficient way of creating jobs. Now, does that mean that I believe we should just use a complete so another French word, laissez-faire approach, where you, the government stays completely hands off, and we just let the globalization go and manage. I'm not so sure, right? And so I share part of the, uh, the view of uh, Denny Roderick, who's an economist at Harvard, who basically said that, uh, you know, we can't deny that uh, globalization is disruptive because some people are gonna lose jobs. And the, uh, the problem that we face is that societies would like to be three things at the same time, and usually you can only have two of those, th of those three. That's what we call a trilemma. 
You cannot be at the same time completely integrated in the global economy, still remain a complete democratic society, and have your national government be completely sovereign. Because if you want to be globally integrated, you're going to need to have rules, right? Like the World Trade Organization sets those rules for global trade. But that means that some of those rules are going to be done by international organizations, not by your domestic country, right? So when um, President Trump says, I'm going to slash import uh, tariff on stuff coming from Mexico uh, to the value of 20%, that's not possible because he's breaking some international rules. So then people who voted for him says, well, he promised he could do this, and now you tell me he cannot do what he said he promised he would do, and then you feel like those organizations are basically preventing your government to do what's best for you. Okay? So that's a big challenge that uh, we face. So I'm more in favor of, of uh, you know, uh, thinking in terms of a smart globalization, where you try to make sure that all the benefits I have uh, put forward are more equally shared, and I think our governments have done a poor job at making sure that all those benefits were more equally shared among uh, 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 every component of our, of our economy. Okay, so my bottom line, if you want to get a message out of that lecture, is that we cannot deny the benefits from trade. But I think people like me maybe have done, or policymakers have done uh, a poor job at explaining the implication of trade. We've oversold the benefits, and we haven't done enough to try to address the cost, right? the, the, the concerns, the anxiety that could come with, uh, with job loss. But my, my, um, my proposition would be that um, there's a big difference between improving globalization, which is what I'm more in favor of, the tra Trans-Pacific Agreement that just got uh, flushed to the, in the toilet, by our, our uh, current administration was meant to do just that, to basically set better rules for global trade and making sure that we would not have that race to the bottom. So I'm more in favor of better, better trade than uh, basically no trade, right? So uh, I think people need to keep in mind that there's a, a big difference between improving global trade and basically uh, you know, reversing it uh, completely. All right, thank you.